the humiliation of Christ is the title for this evening. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Amen. We talked about the unity last week. So beginning with verse 5, Paul says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And so he's giving us an example of how humble Christ was, starting with verse 6, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God. God descended in order to reascend. He came down lowering himself so that he will be elevated. He descended to reascend. He came down from the heights of absolute being into time and space. Down into humanity, down further still into the nature he had created. He created the nature, but he had to come down to it. It is like if you can think of a strong man stooping lower and lower to get himself underneath and in order to lift some heavy burden. It is also like a diver, if you can picture a diver, first reducing to nakedness, then glancing in midair, then gone with a splash, rushing down through black and cold water into the death-like region of slime, then up again back to color and light his lungs almost bursting till suddenly he breaks surface again. Jesus, the king of the universe, as though he was diving into the depths, deepest part of the sea, only to rise again, breaking surface again. Jesus became for us the perfect model then of humiliation. You talk about humiliation being shameful, embarrassed, this is the pinnacle. Jesus became for us the perfect model of humiliation. Look at verse 6. Who though he was in the form of God. Let's break that down. This is where the incarnation begins. That is where God becomes man. That's called incarnation. This is where the incarnation begins, where the dissension and condescension begins. The word form, which is appearing in verse 7, it is a word that refers to essence or essential being or nature. So when you talk about form, you're talking about the very essence, you're talking about the very form, essence or essential being. His deepest being, what he is in himself, his essential being. So when we're talking about the form, we're talking about the very essence, the very nature of God himself. He has always and continuously and unalterably existed in that essence. He never changed from being who he was. So in that form, that essence, the very nature of God, and we make this a very, very important aspect because without this, Christianity would not be supported. We make a big deal of this fact that God condescended into a human form, even though he was fully God, even though in essence, nature, and every form, he was God. He never ceased being God. He became one of us. And that is absolutely important in Christianity. So if you leave this place tonight without remembering anything, just know that God, who was fully God, in every aspect, every nature, God became one of us. You know, every male, for instance, take me for example, I am a man. I was an embryo at one point, became a baby, a child, boy, a youth, a young man, adult, and someday will become 
old or older man. Of course, right now I'm at my prime of life, but these are the stages of life's growth. Jesus went through all of that, but there is a difference in the definition of form. Even though he changed as a result of being a human being, his very essence never changed in the form of God. He possessed the very being and the nature of God. He always possessed that. Again, why is it that we have so much discussion of this? It's because it is the heart and soul of the Christian faith. This is where we are attacked. At this point, the deity of Christ. We are attacked because we say that Jesus Christ is God. You take away Jesus being God, you have no Christianity. Therefore, you will have no salvation. If Jesus is not God, he would have stayed in the grave. And that would be absolutely traumatic. And consequently, we would not need to be here if Christ remained in the grave. Only God can raise himself from the dead. And because Jesus is God, he was able to rise from the dead. In the John's Gospel, let's go over a few verses in the Bible. Jesus seems to be, and it was his passion for John to leave the readers with absolutely no doubt at all that Jesus is God. Just a few places in scripture, in the book of John that is. Chapter 1, verse 1, you know very well. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 3 of chapter 1, John chapter 1, verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him was not any made that was made. And then in verse 14, chapter 1, John, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as the one of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Chapter 8 of John, verse 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Just one other place. Colossians 1, 15 through 17, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is God. There is no other way to interpret this. The Bible, not just in the book of John, but throughout Scripture, we are told that Jesus is equal with God, that Jesus is God. Take, for instance, Jesus creating things. Not only did he create the universe and everything in it, but while he was living, he created fish, he created bread, he created ear when Peter chopped off one of them. He created new legs, new eyes, new ear, new mouth. Internal organs were created by Jesus to replace the diseased ones. He is the creator. He is not the created one, as some religions of the world say. Some Christians even think that Jesus is not the creator, but that he is below God the Father. That's blasphemous because the Bible clearly says that Jesus the Son is equal to the Father, the holy triune God, along with the third person of the Trinity who is the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 1.3, very important place in apologetics that is the Defending of Christian faith, Hebrews 1.3 reads, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Verse 7, let's find out how much he descended. He condescended, he went down, how far? Verse 7, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. That's how low he went, being born in the likeness of men. It was a self-renunciation. He refused to use what was rightfully his. 
he did not cling to privileges as God. Let's talk a little bit about what he emptied. Because in verse 7 it says he emptied himself. What did he empty of? What did Christ empty? Number one, I want you to understand that Jesus did not empty himself of his deity. In other words, he never stopped being God. Just because he came down to become one of us, became a man, and was a servant, does not mean that he let go of his Godhead. He let go of his deity. That's not what we're saying. Because if he let go of that or any part of that, he ceased being God. And we will be in big trouble. Luke 9.32, the mountain of... Mount of Transfiguration. Remember, he pulled back his flesh to show his glory. He always was God. While he was on earth, however, he only simply veiled his humanity. That's all it was. But first thing that he did not empty, or what he did empty, number one, is he emptied himself of his heavenly glory. He emptied himself, number one, of his heavenly glory. John 17, 5 says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So Jesus had this great fellowship and communion with the Father before the world began. But now that he came down to earth, he has let go of that privilege. So the heavenly glory he emptied. He gave up all of the shining brilliance of the glories of heaven for the darkness of this world. Second thing that he emptied himself of is the independent authority. He let go of his voluntary exercise of his will. He let go of his will and learned to be a servant and submitted himself. Because verse 8 says he became obedient. John 5.30, I can do nothing on my own as I hear I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not my own but the will of him who sent me. He emptied himself of independent authority even though he could have called legions of angels. He could have done everything. He could have said, no, I don't want to take this anymore. He could have blasted the earth. But instead, he emptied himself of this independent authority. He submitted himself to the authority of the Father in heaven. Another thing that he emptied himself of is his prerogative of his attributes. Did he stop being omnipotent or omniscient or omnipresent? Did he change of being unchangeable? Did God all of a sudden change? Did God all of a sudden became weak? Did God all of a sudden not know everything? Did God all of a sudden could only appear at one place at the time? It, has he stopped being all those things we call attributes of God? The answer is no. He did not empty himself of these things, attributes. Another thing that he emptied himself of is his personal riches. And you know the next Bible passage very well, 1 Corinthians 8, 9, for, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. He let go of his personal riches. And another thing that he let go or emptied himself of is his relationship with God. You recall 2 Corinthians 5, 21? For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He let go of his relationship with God. You remember while he was on the cross, he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God. He let go for the time being in order to accomplish the goal for which he came. At any moment in time, he could have blasted his enemies off the face of the earth, but he decided not to. But there's something else in this relationship to emptying himself. He also took on something. While emptying himself, he also took on something, put on something. Verse 7, he says, he took the form of a servant. We are told, foretold in Isaiah 52, 
verses 13 to 14, speaking of the coming Messiah, Isaiah prophesied this, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. He looked so disfigured, he had no form of beauty whatsoever. He became a servant. He who owned everything had to borrow things from men. His place of birth had to be borrowed. He didn't have a house. He had to borrow where he can lay his head. He had to borrow a boat to preach. He had to borrow an animal to go into Jerusalem. He had to borrow a tomb. He had no advantages or privileges. He who owned everything, in fact, he created everything, he underwent and left everything in heaven, and he decided to borrow instead. Verse 7, being born in the likeness of men. That's even going further, condescending even further, given essential attributes of humanity, not just the looks of a man, his body, soul, and mind. He was fully man. That's what we cannot grasp. How can the Almighty God become one of us? He, in every essence, he was man, except sin. Why? Because God cannot sin. He never stopped being God. God does not sin, cannot sin. Therefore, Jesus, who was God and is God, did not sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Luke 2.52, we read, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. That's a proof that Jesus was a man. He had to grow in these areas. In wisdom, stature, in favor with God and man. And Hebrews 2.17, therefore, we don't have the PowerPoint on this one, I don't believe. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And in verse 8, and being found in human form. We saw this earlier, but this is different. This means that people saw him as man. Earlier in this passage, we were told that he became one of us. In verse 8, it says he became or he was found in human form. This is important distinction because not only did he become a man, they only saw him as a human. They could not figure out, they missed his deity. They never saw the God part. They only saw the human part. And this is humiliating. God in human flesh was treated the worst of men. He was treated worse than the worst criminal. Did he fight back? Verse 8 says he humbled himself. He was already humiliated, but he had to empty himself. Not only becoming a servant, he had to suffer and feel everything that a human being goes through. But he answered not a word, never a word. People mocked him, pulled his beard, punched him, dragged him naked, had the cross on his back. He never said a word. Verse 8, he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And the word even there is important, which means this is the bottom. He was on a cross, crucifixion. This is the ultimate human embarrassment, originally created by the Persians, perfected by the Romans. It was for a slave and for worse criminals, and that was put on Jesus. Hanging in the sky, stark naked, he went, humbled himself, totally humiliated for us. And that is why in Romans 11.33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. There is just no way for us to understand how can the God of the universe, the darling of heaven, 
had to become one of us in order to save us from eternal damnation. That is why Paul says once again, how unsearchable are his ways. There's no way that we can figure out the grace and love of God. He became one of us. He humbled himself, the humiliation of Christ. Next week, because he was humiliated, he will be exalted. We'll be talking about the exaltation of Christ next Wednesday. This ongoing study in the book of Philippians, I don't know how many of you bring your Bibles. I don't know how many of you take a little bit of a note with your phone somehow, take some notes that way, but these passages that we're covering, if you pay attention, if you put them together, your knowledge of the Bible and the knowledge of that one particular book, which will be very essential in understanding the entire New Testament as a result, systematically understanding the entire Bible, the Word of God. Don't just come and let the Word slip. Pay attention and listen and follow, it'll be spiritual food for you. Sunday, we have discussions, we have a little bit more of perhaps practical stuff, but Wednesday is more of a study, and you need to come with a serious heart, and I know that you do. If you can bring a little bit of a notepad or something where you can jot down a few things that you can go back to later on because you'll miss it the first time. I don't have time to keep repeating, 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 otherwise we'll be here for another 30 minutes. So I finish, we end in prayer, and we have you fellowship and so on. Our time is limited. It's essential that you try to grasp the truth as much as you can. Let us remember tonight that God Almighty came down humbling himself, becoming a man Dying on a cross, even to the dying on a cross. So we worship him tonight. We bow before him. There is none like him. He is God. So when you say Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we're not just saying he is the son of God. We're saying he is the God almighty, the holy, omnipotent God. He is the God, the creator, without whom nothing was made. God, Jesus is the creator God. We worship him tonight. Let's bow our heads in prayer.